All right, team. So in this video session today, we're going to be tackling chapter two. And a lot of this is just the biomechanics of some exercise things that we're going to move through. And I want you to know that we all know that Dr. Priest is our resident biomechanic genius. And so we're just really going to hit some highlights of this in this course. There's part of this on levers that we're going to completely skip over because this is really Dr. Priest thing. But I'm going to kind of show you what I think is important, especially in training um, all athletes and moving in all different ways. So just getting rolling with some things. Um, I want you to know we're jumping in on page 20. And these are just some refreshers. We talk about origin as it's proximal towards the center and insertion is the distal, that's away from the center. So I know I asked you that on your last game day, be prepared to see that again, as far as knowing origin and insertion of muscles, because that becomes important as we learn about moving. Okay, we also talk about agonist and antagonist. We see that the agonist is the primary mover and the antagonist is that muscle that works in opposition. For example, in a bicep curl, the agonist is the bicep shortening, while the antagonist is the tricep lengthening. All muscles are pairs and they work together while one contracts, the other uh, expands. So, and we've also talked about all these different fibrous attachments in the left-hand column of page 20. This is a reminder that our tendons actually connect a muscle to a bone and the ligament connects a bone to a bone. So again, you know these things. And then we also talk about these things called synergists. And synergists are muscles that are actually hanging around and indirectly affecting the contraction or the relaxation. For example, if I think about, go back to that bicep curl, the bicep would be the agonist, the tricep would be the antagonist, but the muscles in the deltoid and really up into the traps would be those synergistic muscles that are firing a little bit, but aren't really those primary movers. So those synergists provide support indirectly for the movement, okay? And then we get to the portion that we're gonna love Dr. Priest with. On page 20, we talk about all the different kinds of levers, but what I want to jump over here, so I'm skipping, 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 I am not crazy about the levers, but I am crazy about the planes. I think when we think about designing programs for athletes, we need to ensure that athletes move in all three of the primary planes of movement. Now, the three planes of movement are basically all mimicked in all different kinds of sports. So that's why we need to train all of them. Uh, the first one that we are going to actually talk about is the sagittal plane. Now, in the sagittal plane, I want us to think of moving like a swing. So all of this sagittal plane is moving forwards and backwards. So again, this is your shoulders, elbows, you guys, your hips also move in the sagittal plane. Your torso will move in the sagittal plane. You can actually see yourself in bending at the hips, legs swinging, toes pointing and flexing. Both dorsiflexion and plantar flexion are movement in the sagittal plane. So when you think sagittal, think swing and think sit. So those are moving in the sagittal plane. When we think about the frontal plane, these are things, think about moving like you're flying, okay? This is movement in the frontal plane. This is movement in the frontal plane. When your hip goes away out to the side, and I'm wearing a skirt today, so I'm not gonna really demonstrate a lot of that. And uh, moving like you're flying is in the sad, moving is in the frontal plane. So think sagittal swing, frontal fly. So that's how we move. And we'll talk about these briefly in class a little bit more. We'll do a big review. And then in your book, there's also kind of a, a chart on page 26 and 27, where it also talks about these different degrees of movement. When you're doing that, always figure out where that red dot is, because that red dot is going to actually be a better landmark for you about how that 
joint will actually move and the joints that move in specific planes. For example, let's talk about your elbows, okay? If you're standing in the correct anatomical position, your elbows can only move in the sagittal plane. Remember, that would be swinging forwards and backwards. If you move your arms this way, remember, this is not your elbows moving. This is your shoulders flying and moving in the frontal plane. Now, what's interesting is your shoulders can also move in the sagittal plane. So remember that. Now, that third plane that we're gonna talk about is the transverse plane. The transverse plane is when your body is actually twisting. So let me tell you what's interesting. Flashback to when we were talking about uniaxial joints. Again, uniaxial joints only move in one plane. The perfect example of these two are the elbow joint and the knee joint. The knee can only move in the sagittal plane. Now, when we stop and think about the frontal plane, if you're standing incorrect, now I'm gonna put them up here. If you're standing incorrect, if we talk about biaxial joints, remember how we talked about your wrist and your ankles? Your biaxial joints move in two perpendicular planes. So remember, your wrists can move in the sagittal plane and they can move in the frontal plane because they're a biaxial joint. Now, when we think about those multi-axial joints, those are those ball and socket joints, and they have the ability to move in the transverse plane as well. That means there's rotation in the joint. You see it in the shoulder, you actually see it, in the hip more and more and more. So remember, your shoulders are so complex, they can move in the sagittal plane, they can move in the frontal plane, and your shoulders and your hips are the same. They can also move in the transverse plane. So think about your neck can also do the same. Your neck, can that would be your cervical spine, seven vertebrae, you can actually see it moving in the sagittal plane. You can see it moving like windshield wipers in the frontal plane. And you can also see your neck moving in the transverse plane. So we wanna think about these motions whenever we are designing programs for athletes. Because again, let's just say I end up, you know, I always pretend like I want to be a professional football player. So let's just say quarterback in the pocket, Okay, right here, remember the elbow only moves in the what? Sagittal plane. So I'm here with the football, drop back, and now all of a sudden, my shoulder joint is gonna be momentarily in the frontal plane, because then when I rotate and throw that football, that is actually in that transverse plane because the bone rotated. So what we need to understand is we need to train athletes in all the planes that the body will move in. So again, if you have specific questions about that, always be sure to ask about those questions. So now a couple things that I need you to also think about is remember that one of our major goals, and I'm in the bottom right hand corner of page 25, some of our major goals are to always have our athletes increase strength and also increase power production. And to do this and to also increase acceleration, there's some things that we need to remember. And this is Newton's second law, that force equals mass times acceleration. So the force, I'm gonna write this, S equals M times A, F equals MA. What we need to remember is, if one of our athletes is going to be able to increase force, they need to either increase their mass or increase their acceleration if this wants to go up. But one of the things we must remember, let's just say we have an athlete that all of a sudden, maybe they weighed 170 pounds and they put on 10 pounds of either fat or of mass. What we need to understand is 
with this increased mass, there's the potential when you do the real math of force production going down because it's gonna be harder for that athlete to move that mass. So think about all this. We really always want force production to go up. We've gotta be careful with mass. With mass, there's the perfect point. Okay, we want our athletes to be as strong as they can, but not overly heavy, as in overly muscle mass or as in over fat. Because the more mass you're moving, it's going to be harder for that acceleration to actually come into play. And we like to call this the perfect point. I think it's actually, you know, your sweet spot. You know, we've all heard athletes when they felt like they were the best, the strongest. And, you know, we know that about ourselves. So really think about F equals MA as it comes together. Okay, let's keep rolling and rocking through some things. Um, again, I'm skipping a lot of this chapter. Um, I'm going to jump in on page 29 now, and it's going to talk about negative work and power. Now, I think this is sort of a misleading term. So I want you to hold on to that for just a minute when we talk about negatives, okay? Because what we need to do is we need to skip a page or two, skip with me, skip with me, and we're going to come over here to page 32. And it's going to talk about the concentric and the eccentric muscle contraction. Now, when you look on page 32, you should see this and you should say, oh wow, that looks kind of familiar. When we see this, we know that a muscle in its relaxed state has the potential to deliver the most force. We know that a muscle in the most contracted rate has already delivered as much force as it absolutely can. And then we see here in this bottom that there's hardly any actin or myosin grabbing on to this completely extended muscle, so it cannot create any more force. So what we would see is, we would see that this is the muscle at its resting length. This is contraction, okay? And this is all of, this would be the concentric phase, and this is the eccentric phase, whenever the actin and the myosin are moving apart from each other. Now, it's during this eccentric phase that we actually refer to that as the, quote, negative phase of exercise. Now, don't think about negative as bad, although it's a little bit interesting. We know that when we call it the negative phase, we're actually seeing that stretching of that actin and myosin. And whenever we have that stretching, of that actin and that myosin, we really see these little bitty tiny micro tears in the muscle. And when we see athletes taking care of themselves with proper nutrition, with proper hydration, we know that when those micro tears actually heal, we know that that athlete is going to be stronger. So we can actually see that strength gains, strength gains are actually best during the eccentric lengthening contraction or we actually refer to this as the negative phase. So whenever the muscle fibers are having to stretch that actin and myosin, that's when we see that going on. Of course, we know we don't want that to go far past our proprioceptors. We know that our muscle spindles are gonna keep us safe and our Golgi tendon organs are gonna shut us down before things go too far. So again, um, for example, a great example of that is, let's say I'm doing a deltoid lateral raise. Whenever I lift that up, the deltoid is actually going to concentrically contract. Those fibers are going to shorten. Now, if I had a really pretty heavy dumbbell out here and I was lowering this against gravity and these muscle fibers were stretching during the eccentric or negative phase, that's when that deltoid is actually going to have some time, it's gonna repair, it's gonna be fueled, it's gonna be hydrated, and then that deltoid will actually be stronger. So during that eccentric negative phase is when things get stronger. 
And it talks about concentric and eccentric right there on page, again, 32 in that right-hand column. Now, there's one other thing that we talk about here, and this is an isometric contraction. An isometric contraction happens whenever you see force applied in a muscle, but the muscle fibers are actually neither contracted nor lengthened. Now, sometimes isometric contractions can be a great way to increase strength, but we really don't do that as much as we should because we're humans that were made to move. So an example of an isometric contraction would be contracting your abdominal wall and holding it there. I'm not either contracting the rectus abdominis nor extending the rectus abdominis. Again, it's just a, an isometric hold. Um, another example would be, again, pretend this is a 30 pound dumbbell and I am just isometrically holding it right there against gravity. The muscle fibers are not lengthening, nor they're contracting. It's a fun way to train. We also see another great example of working on planks is a great way to isometrically contract many muscles in your body. So awesome, we're going to turn back just a little bit. Now, again, you're gonna know the answer to this question. One of the things that affects strength is, and I'm gonna ask the question and pause because while you're watching, I want you to say the answer out loud. Okay, of all the systems in the body to arrive on the scene to create change first, which one is it? You guessed it. It's the nervous system. What the body can do is, and if you'll refer back to the whole all or none principle, after we have stimulated twitch, our nervous system through that neurotransmitter acetylcholine stimulates muscle twitch. And as it stimulates muscle twitch, remember it gets all of them. But what we know is that their body can do this really cool thing called recruitment. And what the body does is it says, hey, you know what? I don't need these little tiny, tiny, tiny muscle fibers right now. I'm gonna step ahead and recruit the muscle fibers that I need to get the job done. For example, I really could take this marker and I could pick it up and put it down in my hand probably for the next hour. And those little bitty neurons, those little bitty muscle fibers that are located in my fingers, those are not giant muscle fibers. They could keep doing that. They could keep doing that. These are like energizer bunnies. They can keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Tiny muscle fibers. Now, let's say for example, I came over here and instead of doing that, I grabbed the chair. Now, what we know is if I all of a sudden started picking up this chair repeatedly, I had to recruit larger muscle fibers to get that job done. Now let's take it one step farther. Let's just say I didn't want to pick up the marker and I didn't want to pick up the chair, but I wanted to pick up this entire desk that this computer is sitting on. In doing that, my body would naturally sort of selectively recruit the muscle fibers that it would do. It would skip over the little ones, skip over the medium ones, and go right to the big guns. That's the beauty of neurological recruitment and that process. So another thing, guys, I'm gonna flip over because, you know what, maybe it's in a different chapter that we talk about that. So remember what I talked about, about neural recruitment. Now, there's something else because, you know, it talks about the nervous system right there and how important it is with recruiting. Now, let's also talk about something cool. This is called muscle pination and the angle that a muscle is checked in. Now, what I want you to know is, Look at this basketball guy and his purple shorts and everything on page 31. Let's look at a different group of muscles here. So the first one I want us to look at is this L, this longitudinal muscle. Now, if you'll look at that, those muscle fibers are all running parallel, just like railroad tracks. Now, here's what's interesting about this longitudinal muscle. It can only move in one plane, especially the rectus, the rectus abdominis. 
okay? The rectus abdominis has one job. It all of a sudden can take you into spinal flexion, okay? So when your rectus abdominis contracts, it shortens it. And because they're muscle fibers that are longitudinal, they are not in charge of doing anything else but shortening and, you know, they're not in charge of rotation. Simply moving in one plane. Now, let's make that a little bit more difficult. Let's actually start to look at, um, let's look at M. Let's go with a completely different contrast to that. If we look at M, that's that deltoid muscle. Now, if you'll remember, that deltoid muscle moved in the sagittal plane, it moved in the frontal plane, and it moved in the transverse plane. So what we see, that deltoid muscle has to have multi-penate angles that come together. And that's like these feather-like arrangements so that all of those muscles, that muscle can move in all of those different planes. The one thing that we need to remember when we talk about muscle penation is, and this is not in your book, this is a McKay-ism. Now, think about this. When you think about your rectus abdominis versus your deltoid, which muscle has more stability? If you answered rectus abdominis, you're right. Because that muscle only moves in one way, it's a much more stable muscle. Think about it. It holds your organs in. It's just one of our torso muscles that helps provide this stability. Now, contrast that to the deltoid muscle. The deltoid muscle, because it moves in all three of those planes, has less stability, but more mobility. And here's what we have to understand. To, for a muscle to have more mobility, it's going to have less stability. That's why our human beautiful bodies were designed with all of these different levels of penation because they all do different things. So again, to have more mobility, you have to be willing to give up some stability. Okay, now another thing that I wanna quickly talk about and we really sort of mentioned it when we talked about force equals mass times acceleration. One of the things that we need to always be thinking about is the strength to mass ratio. Again, if we end up with an athlete that is carrying more mass than they actually need, it comes down to a decrease in force production. And remember, that is never what we want. So think about this. If I am going to bet, say I'm going to go to a powerlifting meet, and I am looking at two different athletes. One athlete is 6'2 and has really long levers, okay? So again, athlete A, 6'2, long levers, okay? Now, Here's my other athlete. This athlete, okay, let's just say this athlete is five feet, let's go ahead and make him five feet eight inches. We won't make him that short. Okay, now here's what we know. When we talk about the ability of force production as it moves over leather, lever length, we know that it's going to be more challenging for this person that's 6'2 to generate force over that much distance. So they will not have the ability to accelerate it as much. So therefore force is going to go down. When you think about power lifters, really they are better power lifters if they are smaller and a little bit more contract, a little bit more compact because they're not having to accelerate the weight as far of a distance. Think about the, doing an entire power clean. If you're 6'2 and you are moving that weight all the way up 
to that shoulder level, which you know probably is about you know five nine or so. That's a long way to forcefully move weight. And then when you think about this guy, not quite as challenging. So this athlete really is going to be more efficient and effective at moving that force. Now, what's kind of interesting that makes us level the field is this thing called the classic formula. And it talks about the classic formula in your book in the right hand column of page 33. And I tell you, there have some, been some beautiful geniuses and some mechanic biomechanists that figured out, hey, you know what, at a powerlifting meet, I know if you've been before, you've seen all these fancy charts. What this says is, if I take my athletes, you guys, if I take their body, the load that they lifted, and I divide it by the athlete's body weight to the two thirds power, which you don't have to know that, or be able to do that math, you're welcome. It really levels the playing field of the distance that this athlete has to move the weight versus the distance that this athlete has to move the weight. So again, I do want you to know about the classic formula because you don't have to know how to do it, but I want this to be in your inventory because this really provides an opportunity for us to compare and contrast, and again, maybe level the playing field when it comes to competition. So a couple things, let's keep rocking and rolling. Uh, as we think about different sources of resistance for muscle contraction, you guys, the very first source of resistance that we encounter the minute that we land on the planet is gravity. Grab a T, grab a T. Now gravity has been working on us since the moment we arrived on Earth. You know, we, John Mayer sings that gravity is working against you. Gravity is a force that is always acting down. So when we think about, let's say we're doing a bench press, all of a sudden, again, this would be the concentric positive contraction phase. This would be the eccentric phase of that exercise. Again, that concentric, that's that eccentric, okay? And not only do I have the actin and the myosin stretching, but I also have gravity continuing to push that weight down that I'm having to overcome. So that's another interesting thing about working with it that way. Now, Another thing that comes into play with sources of resistance is we talk about weight stack machines. No, wait, there's one in here before. There's one in here before. We talk about gravity, and then we talk about weight stack machines. Now, weight stack machines are a safe, efficient way for us to train. Uh, it talks about ease of use. Now, here's what I'll say. I'm not a giant fan of weight stack machines in, unless maybe you're doing them for a specific reason. I know some people do leg extension, leg curl. They focus on those, maybe leg press. But what I really tend to think of being a more efficient and effective way is free weights. I love free weight training because free weights training allows us to do whole body training. It's a lot cheaper to purchase free weights than to purchase a whole set of weight stack machines. Free weights also tend to be more portable, again, more affordable. And then free weights allow us to move in all of the planes. For example, I could actually do a squat the same time that I might be doing an overhead press, doing multi exercises at one time. So I kind of love that. Now, another source of training is inertia. Now, if you've ever done any work with med balls or any kind of javelin, shot put, all of these things are a form of inertial training. So what inertial, inertia is, is it's taking an object and moving it across space. It's moving across space, but remember, what does it have pushing on it as well? 
it actually has gravity pushing it down. Now this might be a really failed attempt. I've never really tried this before. So again, if I all of a sudden start to throw this, let me do it like this, let me know. If I all of a sudden start to throw this eraser, again, it's going to all of a sudden go in an arc because it's going to have gravity working against it as it moves through space. So take that same premise and apply it to like doing med ball training. If I'm all of a sudden doing med ball passes with a workout partner, that is gonna leave forcefully from my hands. It's going to have to overcome distance while gravity is pushing down on it before that other workout partner eccentrically receives that med ball. So that's a fun way to train with things as well. Uh, you guys, it's talking about, you know, in your book in the right hand column on page 35, it talks about the power clean. Is an, any time where you're forcefully moving something against gravity through space is a perfect example of inertial training. Okay, uh, one of my other time favorite kinds of training on page 36 is using friction training. And friction training happens when you take one object and press it against another and try to move it back and forth. Again, remember, we have gravity pushing down on this. The perfect example is sleds in football, where all of a sudden we're having our athletes push. Another thing is, and I hope you didn't have this sort of punishment dealt out to you, but has anyone in here watching ever had to do towel pushes down the gym floor? Now, again, are towel pushes a great form of doing friction training if that's what you're trying to do? Absolutely, but I hate it when we use exercise as punishment. That's just a side in the keynote. Now, when we think about all of these coming together with friction training, I kind of love friction training because whenever you have one object pressed against another and you're trying to move it, you are not, hey, I had an idea. Hold on just a second. Okay, so I went and got the eraser off of the smart board. So now I actually have two erasers, two services that I'm actually trying to slide back and forth against each other. What's interesting about friction training is friction training not only activates the muscle that is the con centric muscle and an eccentric muscle, friction training is fabulous at capturing all of those synergistic muscles as well. And remember those synergistic muscles are the ones that are acting indirectly, but those are that support crew. Uh, kind of think of it, remember, the, um, the agonist is the star of the show, the antagonist is also the star of the show, but sort of the villain. And then you have your support cast as your synergist when it comes together. Uh, next source of resistance we talk about is fluid training. Uh, the perfect example from this, down the hall, in the pool. Whenever you think about training with fluid, you actually end up, when you get in the pool, you have pressure on you 360 degrees. So just moving in any direction, whether it is the sagittal plane, whether it is the frontal plane or the transverse plane, you have that fluid pressing against you as a source of resistance. If you haven't gotten in the pool in a while, I would encourage you to maybe give it a spin because it talks about in the left-hand column of page 37, whenever you are in a fluid resistant thing, what it does is it creates a surface drag. Um, if you think about even the little hairs on your arms, create a surface, surface drag effect. That's why our Olympic swimmers have those phenomenal, expensive swimsuits made. Because what they do is they're sl so slick that they end up creating minimal surface drag. So therefore, they can move more efficiently and effective throughout that competition. So then another one that we talk about is elasticity. Elasticity is fabulous because 
Number one, if you've ever used with been doing any work with resistive bands, you can make people hurt in a good, strong way with resistive bands. Resistive bands really are fabulous at activating the eccentric contraction or the negative phase. For example, if I'm working with a resistive band and I take it into that bicep curl and then I'm taking it down, not only is the band forcefully wanting to shorten, I also have gravity working against me, but I also have that pull on that actin and myosin. It's even a little bit more than just would be a standard, D, a standard dumbbell because that elastic is forcing me to resist against the eccentric negative contraction. So I love doing band work. Another cool thing about band work is, you guys, I can purchase a pretty rigid, I mean, pretty tough resistive band for about 10 or 12 bucks. I can throw it in my suitcase. I can take a portable gym with me anytime, anywhere I go and really help work in that eccentric phase. It also does fire up those synergist muscles as well. You just got to get creative. Um, it's a great way um, to really work on pulling with resistive bands. And then we know we are actually working that posterior chain. Remember anterior chain, the front of the body, posterior chain, the back of the body. We really want to ensure that we're working that posterior chain even a little bit more than we do our anterior chain. Remember the front muscles, show muscles, back muscles, go muscles. We want to be going more than we are showing. So take a breath. You've done great in this video. I am loving spending every minute with you all. Again, there's going to be two videos uploaded for you to watch. Again, I put a part three of chapter three up. And then there's also this part one of chapter two. We're going to finish up chapter two when we talk about a few different joint concerns in the body. We need to talk about the knee specifically. We need to talk about the shoulder specifically as it also comes to, uh, you know, there's some specific concerns when it relates to females and the knee. We're going to talk about that. Again, some tricky joints. Keep moving. If you have any questions as you put your game plan and this video together, be sure to either email me those questions or zoom into the room when we're back in session on Tuesday or write down those questions if you intend to be in class. I know that this is a creative way to learn. I thank you again for going with me on this journey. I want to make these videos as fun and funky and real as they possibly can to hopefully make you feel like you're not just taking an online class, but you're actually learning in the room with me. So thank you so much. God bless you all. Have the best day over ever. Get the tools to build those fearless champions. Remain efficient and effective. And I know you will because you are smart people. I'll see you on Tuesday. Enjoy your Memorial Weekend. And hey, be thankful for our people that are in the military. Find a veteran. Find someone that's active military on Memorial Day and tell them thank you for their service. We're pretty blessed to get to be where we live and have the privileges that we get to have as Americans. Remember to express your gratitude. Number one, one alarm, two feet on the ground. Express that gratitude. Drink that water and make that bad. See you soon, friends. Bye.